Good morning and welcome once more to Morning Prayer. Today is Thursday, the 30th of March. Our readings today are Psalms 103, Jeremiah 26, 1 to 16, and Romans 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 to 12. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come together as a family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins and to seek his grace, that through his Son Jesus Christ we may give ourselves to his service. God will not judge us by appearances, he will rule with justice. Let us worship and praise him. Lord, open our lips that we may glorify and praise your name. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We say together a shout to the Lord. A shout to the Lord in triumph all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good, his loving mercy is forever, his faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. As we go into a time of penitence, we just take time to reflect on the last couple of days, last week or two, whatever it's been. Just think of the things that you've done that may have driven a wedge between you and God, or may have affected your neighbours or your loved ones in some negative way. And then as we pray, we ask for forgiveness of these things. And so we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn now to Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that, was, all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sin and heals all your infirmities, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with mercy and compassion, who satisfies your being with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He makes known his ways to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great goodness. He will not always be chiding, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. <clears throat> For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy over those that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he set our sins from us. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender towards those that fear him. For he knows of what we are made. He remembers that we are but dust, the days of man are as grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, and when the wind blows over it, it's gone. 
and its place knows it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever and ever toward those that hear him. And his righteousness upon their children's children, upon those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments to do, to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, all your angels, you that excel in strength, you that fulfill his word and obey the voice of his commandment. Praise the Lord, all you his hosts, his servants, who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 1 to 16. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Joash, the king of Judah, the word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen. And each will turn from the evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say to them, This is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words uh, of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shara and the city a curse among all the nations of the earth. The priests, the prophets, and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, You must die. Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh, and the city will be desolate, desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death. Because he has prophesied against the city, you have heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and the city, and all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions, and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to speak all these words in your hearing. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, This man should not be sentenced to death. He has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Here ends our first lesson. We say together the song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us. He promised to show mercy to our forebears and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. 
You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading today is from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 26. I'm reading from the message. Does this mean, then, that God is so fed up with Israel that he'll have nothing more to do with them? Hardly. Remember that I, the one writing these things, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham out of the tribe of Benjamin. You can't catch more, you can't get much more Semitic than that. So we're not talking about repudiation. God has too long been involved with Israel. He has too much invested to simply wash his hands of them. Do you remember the time Elijah was agonizing over the same Israel and cried out in prayer, God, they murdered your prophets. They trashed your altars. I'm the only one left, and now they're after me. Do you remember God's answer? I still have 7,000 who haven't quit. 7,000 who are loyal to the finish. It's the same today. There's a fiercely loyal minority still. Not many perhaps, but probably more than you think. They're holding on, not because of what they think they're going to get out of it, but because they're convinced of God's grace and purpose in choosing them. If they were only thinking of their own immediate self-interest, they would have left long ago. And then, what happened? Well, when Israel tried to be right with God on their own, pursuing their own self-interest, she didn't succeed. The chosen ones of God were also uh, with the chosen ones of God were those who let God pursue his interest in them, and as a result received his stamp of legitimacy. The self-interest Israel became thick skinned towards God. Moses and Isaiah both commented on this. Fed up with their quarrelsome, self centered ways, God blurred their eyes and dulled their ears shut them in on themselves in a hall of mirrors. And they're there to this day. David was upset about the same thing. I hope they get sick of eating self-serving meals, break a leg while walking their self-serving ways. I hope they go blind staring into their mirrors and get ulcers from playing at God. The next question is, are they down for the count? Are they out of this for good? And the answer is a clear-cut no. Ironically, when they walked out, they left the door open and the outsiders walked in. But the next thing you know, the Jews were starting to wonder if perhaps they had walked out on a good thing. Now, if their leaving, if their leaving triggered this worldwide coming of non-Jewish outsiders to God's kingdom, just imagine the effect of their coming back. What a homecoming! But I don't want to go on about them as you, the outsiders that I'm concerned with now. Because my own personal assignment is focused on the so-called outsiders. I make as much of this as I can when I'm among my Israelite king. The so-called insiders, hoping they realize what they're missing and want to get in on what God is doing. If they're failing out, if they're falling out, irritated, uh, initiated this worldwide coming together, their recovery is going to settle something even bigger. Mass homecoming. If the first thing the Jews did, even though it was wrong for them, turned out for your good, just think what's going to happen when they get it right. Behind and underneath all this, there is a holy God planted God tended root. If the primary root of the tree is holy, there is bound to be some holy fruit. 
Here ends our second lesson. I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 5 verse 17 for a while where Paul explains how sin came into the world. He says for if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteous reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Abraham, as we know, was the patriarch and is the patriarch of many religions. He's been described as being a friend of God. He was loyal and he was obedient. He had faith that caused him to believe that because of God's promise to him that he would father a great nation, he was prepared to take the chance of sacrificing his only son. His son was the only hope of actually starting the nation that he was, that he was told he would father and, and he was instructed to, to kill him. As you know, that never happened. At the last minute, there was a reprieve. But because of his willingness to continue listening and obeying God, he and the nation that developed from his, from his son and from their lineage was set aside by God to be an example to the rest of the world, the Israelites. They were going to be an example of God's love and his provision. And we know they didn't really do a good job of that. They kept falling. And they were kept given multiple chances to, to self-rectify. Didn't happen. And then Jesus, the only son of God, was sent to be an example to them again. First, he was sent to the Israelites, who chose to reject him, and, and then he came to the Gentiles. Of course, the Gentiles are every race that isn't Jewish. So the relationship with God couldn't be a national thing. It was a personal thing, a personal relationship as Abraham had with God. That relationship that you and I can have with God is not dependent on what ethnic group or which church denomination we belong to. It belongs on each and every one of us individually. Jeremiah 31, 29 says, In those days people will no longer say, The parents have eaten sour grapes and their children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be put on edge. Now Jeremiah, as we read, was told to prophesy against Judah and, and it was a, a really unpopular message. It, it wasn't something that people wanted to hear. He was also told not to change the message, not to omit any words and probably not to embellish it in some sugarcoating type way either. The message wasn't to be made more palatable. It was to be given to them straight up. It nearly cost him his life. But it made me start thinking about how do we spread God's word? Do we alter it to make it more appealing? Do we give it as we understand it? We've all heard that the Christian church is shrinking. Statistics seem to support that, and, and I worry that sometimes we may panic. And through panic, we may be tempted to try and grow the church by hiding God's word in some form of entertainment, hoping that a sort of subliminal message will, will lead to conversion. But we need to remember the story of Elijah as well. He thought he was the last true believer, the last prophet. 
and then God put him right. He said, I've got another 7,000 people that haven't bent the knee to Baal. And this should show us that no matter how bleak things seem to be, God has a plan. God is in control. It doesn't mean we can just sit back and wait for him to do. We need to bring this message to the broken world. Each and every one of us has a sphere of influence. Our friends, our families, and anyone that we interact with are all influenced by our words and actions. How you speak to the car guard that's been looking after your vehicle when you park it in our streets, or the cashier at the supermarket, or the wealthy businessman that owns the shop that you're shopping in, doesn't matter what level we're talking about, how you address people shows or should reflect the love of God. Our words and our actions must be in sync. No good talking a talk and not walking the walk. The message that we give should be a simple message of love, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, tolerance, integrity, and faithfulness are the things that we should be projecting. And yet, no matter how hard we try, we all of us are going to fail sooner or later. We're human. It's going to happen. But you know, it doesn't really matter how many times we fail. What really, really counts is how many times we get up and then try to do better. And so just as Jeremiah was giving a message to deliver, a very difficult message, each one of us has been called to deliver a message. As St. Francis said to his followers, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Our actions should speak volumes. It's our own choice, of course, what you do with a calling. Are we in this life for selfish gain? Or are we here to help others in whichever way we can? Spiritually, financially, it doesn't. I don't know what resources you have. I know what resources I have. How do we use them? Are we showing by example what is right in the eyes of the Lord? You know, not everyone's going to like that. There will people that will be people that will object to it, people that revolt against it. John 15, 18 to 19 says, If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. This is Jesus speaking. If you belong to the world, it will love you as it's your own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And that is why the world hates you. I pray now that we will all be given the courage and the wisdom, the strength to carry on showing the world the power and the love of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. We say together the song of the church. We praise you, O God, we acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing an endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of Majesty Unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of worship, and the Holy Spirit, Advocate and Guide. You, Christ, are the King of Glory, the Eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you humbly chose the Virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the Kingdom of Heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come to be our judge. 
Come then, Lord, and help your people, bore to the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Keep us today, Lord, from all sin. Have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. Never let us be put to shame. We say now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He died and he was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us your uh, sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord and grant us your salvation. O Lord, be gracious to our land, and mercifully hear us when we call upon you. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your servants shout with joy. O Lord, make your ways known upon the earth. Let all nations acknowledge your saving power. Give your people the blessing of peace, and let your glory be over all the world. Make our hearts clean, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Our colleague for today. God of all consolation and hope, you breathe life into dry bones and weary souls. Pour out your spirit upon us that we may face despair and death in the hope of resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and the lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your servants, from all assaults of our enemies, that we may trust in your defence, and not fear the power of any adversaries through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and everlasting Father, you have safely brought us to the beginning of another day. Defend us by your mighty power that we may be kept free from all sin, and safe from every danger, and enable us this day to do only what is right in your eyes, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today we just pray for all the families that have lost a loved one recently or around this time. We pray for comfort for them. It doesn't make sense sometimes and we question why we get angry. We may lose trust in God because of things like that. But I just pray, and we all pray together, that those who feel rejected because of the death of a loved one will realize and understand that it's nature. It happens. It happens to everyone. As it says in the Psalms, we like grass in the field, and the wind blows over it. 
and it's remembered no more. But we remember. We remember those who have gone before us, those that we've loved. And we just pray for comfort and healing for all of those who are grieving. I'll ask you to pray with me now, the prayer attributed to St. Francis. A wonderful prayer that if we live to this prayer, we'll make a change in the world. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there's hatred, let us show love. Where there's injury, pardon. And where there's discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it's in giving that we receive. And it's in pardoning that we pardoned. And it's in dying that we're born to eternal life. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forever. Amen. I wish you a wonderful day and a, a good weekend coming up. And um, God willing, I'll see you again in two weeks' time. Be blessed.